Have you ever wondered how deep tech companies actually start? Well, we were too. So in this podcast, we'll be interviewing scientists and entrepreneurs that have taken their ideas out of the lab and turned them into startups. I'm Antonia. And I'm Christina. And this is Startup the Science. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another expert episode of Startup the Science. Today, we're talking with Mike Richardson, who will do a proper introduction within the episode. Mike is part of our Enum network, and he is by far one of the most amazing networkers we've ever seen. And that's why we decided to invite him on the podcast to talk about networking with, within the deep tech world. However, <laughs> our world has gone a little bit topsy-turvy in recent weeks, and I think everyone can relate. And so we did question whether or not networking would be a good topic to tackle when we're all socially and physically distancing ourselves from one another. But the answer is yes. It's a great subject matter to tackle. And I can tell you right now, this is not just for deep tech startups. I think this is universal. Mike talks about making genuine and true human connections. And if you're feeling a little skeptical about that, don't worry. Mike will change your mind. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I've enjoyed listening back on it. I hope it brings you some positive energy in this weird time. And with that, a small disclaimer. Antonia and I have been working from our homes, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. And we're trying to find a solution that brings the best and the highest quality recordings to you, our listeners. So within this episode, you might hear a few interesting noises and sounds. We'd like to thank you very much for your patience and understanding Please bear with us during this weird transitional time between what we've been used to and what we have to get used to. And that's the end of my disclaimer. So here is our conversation, our absolutely lovely conversation with Mike Richardson. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Mike. Lovely to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Let's start with an introduction. Can you tell us a bit about your background, your experience in the startup world, and just generally who you are? Well, hi, I'm Mike Richardson. I'm managing director and founder of a company called Photonic Insights, where I produce low-cost near-infrared spectrographic instruments for materials analysis. Basically, it's a low-cost tool to evaluate quality of food. And aside from that, I'm a guest researcher at Fraunhofer IZM, and I've been a hardware hacker ever since I can remember. Yes, and we would say that apart from that, you're also probably the best networker we know, definitely the best uh, networker in Berlin. And we'll come to that in a bit. But first, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a bit more about the startup scene in Berlin, particularly the deep tech startup scene that you're a part of with your company, Photonics Insights. Can you tell me a bit about uh, how you're finding the ecosystem here in Berlin when it comes to startups, um, especially in the, in the deep tech space? Well, the deep tech scene is, I'd say it's primarily defined by the ease of access to research institutions. That's really the anchor of the deep tech community because deep technology is, of course, dependent on research, right? Applying that research. So in regard to that community, to answer this question, um, I'll just get into how I engage with it. If you remember going to university, how difficult it could be to meet a department head, right? You always be stuck with a TA, yet somehow my experience here in Berlin is that I'll see professors lecturing about a very interesting subject and I'll just go up to them and ask them if I can get access to a paper or tell me where your paper is. I'll read the paper, follow up in an email, and voila, I'll usually get a lunch meeting. Uh, this is incredible, and I haven't had this experience anywhere else on the planet. So this is kind of getting into the network and the deep tech scene, but what I'm sharing initially for everyone to know is that it's completely accessible. You can do it. You just have to take the time and effort. It's not about sending emails and expecting a professor to respond. It's like really going to these lectures and interacting. So I think that's a very good point. And one of the things we're hearing from our startups when it comes to networking is that many of them feel that it's a chore. It's something they're aware they have to do. They're aware they have to build a strong network around them. 
but it's not something they're really looking forward to. It seems more like um, a bit of a dreaded task of going to events, collecting business cards, writing follow-up emails, nothing too exciting. On the other hand, when we see you networking, you seem to, first of all, really enjoy it. And then, of course, you're also very good at it. And that's one of the reasons we invited you on our podcast today. We've had a previous expert episodes where we discussed uh, very important things for deep tech startups, like IP strategy, how to build a good business plan, how to find your first customer customers. And today we wanted to talk about the importance of building a strong network, not solely focused on customers and investors, but generally building a support system around you. And I want to ask you if you can share some of your secrets of how you do that in such a natural, authentic way. Um, what's what's the magic behind your, your networking secrets? It's pure empathy to begin with. So um, part of it's my psychology and how I'm wired and how I've learned to adapt to it. So you're mentioning that startups dread this. This is actually the part I love the most is the networking because I get to make connections with people. There's nothing better for me to do in the world than that. I absolutely love it. And if you hear my enthusiasm, you may be getting an idea of how I do this. So number one, it's never make a business connection. Okay, that might be for VCs that are able to drop checks for 50,000, 100,000. That's a different level. So just get that out of your head when you're make when you're networking and really think of it more as you're building a community. So like what's one thing people say I'm all hyper excitable. Yeah. So one part of this is when you meet someone, be excited. And you can't make that up. So how do you be, how are you excited when you meet someone in the research realm? Well, get an idea who's going to show up at an event and see what they've published and read the abstract at a bare minimum. See, what I'm saying is that it's what you offer to someone is how you connect. It's not what you're going to take from them. If you go into this thinking, I need this from you, I need this from you, I need this from you, eh, you know, it's just a sales call, right? You're not being human or genuine. But when you are in a position where you are thinking, hmm, I've read this paper, uh, this professor has this very interesting position, uh, this very interesting opinion, perhaps I can share some information and offer something to him or her. So this is the key point about that I found making a network. It's what I give, not what I can take to begin with. Okay, so when it comes to academia, one way to connect with people in research, with professors or researchers in general, would be to have a basic idea of what their research is about, perhaps what they've published before, and start the conversation with that. And that seems like a very good, a very good tip. What about when startups are trying to connect with uh, large organizations, with corporations, for example? How do they find the right people, considering the amount of people that um, they could potentially reach out to? How do they know who the right person is? And once they've identified those people, what would be your advice? How should they go about creating those connections, those more authentic connections? Okay, well, because I love Enom and the community so much, I'm going to give some of my secrets away here. Okay, so let's see, you're dealing with a corporation. You might think that you want to go to the department head or the vice president directly. Yeah, that's nice, but there's a thousand other people that want to do that, so you will get a very nice handshake, probably a firm one. Well, not handshakes anymore. It'll be something else, right? Uh, and you'll make eye contact and you'll feel warm and, hey, that's great, and then you won't get any follow-up. That's because someone at that level, that's their job. Right, Their job is not to follow up. That's done within different circles. So who do you approach? Let's say we're looking at one, we're going to call it FUBAR manufacturer, and we've got the vice president. You use that as an entry point, but you find out who does the work for the VP. Right? Who is the assistant? may not be an administrative assistant, but this is where you need to observe and take note. Who is the person returning the emails? Who is the gatekeeper for time and access? And that is the person you need to connect with because that person will enable you to get good talking time with that VP, not the VP. See, what the VP says is, hey, that's a great idea. They'll reach out to their assistant to schedule that appointment. So instead of going top down, what I propose and what's been successful for me is I, I look at who is actually doing the work in the organization and that's who I make the connection with. Now, you're dealing with a worker right? Just like you, someone who's working to get stuff done. So that means you need to be time efficient. And instead of a take, it's a give. So you understand their workload and say, hey, 
I am offering this because it can help your organization with this. And in fact, it's gonna save you time. So you're looking at points of pain, right? However, from genuine empathy, not as a sales technique. It's like putting yourself in their shoes and understanding, wow, this is very difficult. You know, what can help me? So I hope that's answering, but that's the, one of the secrets is you use the top to get the name recognition and your foot in the door, but to actually take action and exploit and use this connection, you need to find the functional subordinate that actually is the gatekeeper. Yes, that's definitely very good advice and I'm sure very useful for um, everyone out there listening and hoping to, to build a better network. So on this general topic, let's maybe take a step back and talk about the importance of building a network. Maybe it's obvious, but um, I don't think it always is. Like, why do we why do we even have to put our energy and our focus on building a support network? It's not always because of the immediate gain we might have, like finding customers or investors, if we're an early stage startup, especially. But it is, I would say, and um, maybe you agree, about um, generally having a support system around you and getting to know as many people as you possibly can from a wide range of, of fields. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience on how your network has helped you in the past and why it's important to have a strong network? What I would say about the network is actually it has to be comprised of things that are, have no involvement with your business at all. This is key, meaning that's why I like deep technology. I'm in photonics and spectroscopy, right? But I get help from people in physics, biotechnology, all sorts of different uh, disciplines. So this is one thing. When you're making your network, just like I'm a photonics guy, I've got great networking there. You know, got Carlos from uh, Epic and really some great, great connections that provide support. But the ones that help me think out of the box and, and make breakthroughs are people that are not involved in the direct industry I'm working in. So, oh boy, I've got to just think of a, a recent example. Well, my company's working on a project. It's with water quality. And... Uh, it ended up a connection working in biology in Potsdam somehow strengthened the connection to establish uh, my company to do some pilot work with Liebens Institute for water quality analysis. That didn't come via um, Optech BB, which is a great group for photonics. It didn't come from Epic. It came from beer conversations I had in Potsdam with researchers and somehow spectroscopy ties together a lot of research fields and somehow that led into water. So this somehow I'm mentioning is serendipity, right? So it's leveraging the power of serendipity. So how did I get involved in a water project and I didn't directly approach the vertical that I'm working in? It's because of serendipity. Serendipity and knowing where the good beer is right? <laughs> That's what you said before. Well, absolutely. I mean, if, you know, we're in Berlin. And so even if you don't drink beer anymore, which I've stopped drinking beer <clears throat> sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, that really helps. So this is getting back to the human connection, right? It's not wanting someone. You give, give, give. And it's really tiring and you're going to be fatigued because you're going to think, I just keep giving and giving. People are exploiting my connections. I'm not getting any value back. But then I guarantee you, just stay with the giving attitude because all of a sudden people will come out of nowhere and reward you. Uh, the director of my company now. See, my company has, we have, I have a team now. I mean, I started as a solo shop and I built this company based on these networking skills. My CTO, co-founder, Andre, I met him at an artificial intelligence event, right? Nothing to do with photonics, but hey, I love AI and machine learning and I like to stay, you know, current. And that's where I met Andre. So how did that connect with photonics? Heartfelt connection, eye contact, empathy, opening up, being vulnerable, being human, and seeing joy in the other human, not for what you can get from them, but by seeing what you can offer them to help them. That's a very nice way of putting it. And I think also a very good tip on how to find networking less of a chore and more enjoyable by building those genuine connections. Let's talk a bit about an event that uh, happened last weekend um, and that I believe came about so fast and it turned out so well because of the power of networks, especially your network. And I'm referring to a hackathon we um, co-organized uh, 
um, last weekend called Hack Corona. And um, in the light of the recent events that have been going on and the corona crisis we're all facing, we put together very, very fast this um, hackathon with four challenges at its core. And then with almost 2,000 people registering to, to try to solve these challenges. So the whole event, um, I think, is quite impressive in terms of organization. But what I'd like to focus on um, within the scope of our conversation is how putting something like this together in a very short amount of time is possible when you have a strong network and when you've already uh, built connections across a very wide range of of fields, even countries. I mean, this was a global event and it was very, very nicely done. So can you tell us a bit about how uh, your network has helped make that happen? Oh, thank you so much for mentioning that. And really, I, I'm just, I was just a lightning rod. I mean, my God, what Enom did, the support you provided was amazing. But okay, I'll just tell the story and this and how this folds back into networking. What's your ultimate goal with networking? If you're trying to buy or sell something, drop it. Okay, that's not going to work, or at least that's not how I function. The ultimate goal is establishment of trust, because in our rapidly changing world, we live in a VUCA world, the one lubricant that accelerates is trust. And that's how we built this hackathon so quickly. Trust means that when you tell stories and communicate, you can act quickly without formal trust, uh, third-party trust mechanisms, right? I mean, there's no blockchain needed when there's human trust. So what happened was um, uh, I've been following coronavirus very closely, warning a lot of people. That's because I'd been working in Asia, so I had acute sensitivity to what was going on because I was on the tailing edge of events in Wuhan. So I saw it. I knew something bad was coming. And uh, back in Berlin, I just think, you know, really itching like, hey, got to do something, got to do something. Well, it ends up I used to be a board member for an organization in Berlin called Hack Health. Health. So I called my friend Yosha on Sunday and said, hey, let's do another hackathon. This is exactly what the organization is for. I know I'm not part of the organization, but you know I know a lot of people, Yosha. Let's do this. And Yosha said, oh, I've been uh, had a few conversations with uh, Marin Leshe. She's from uh, New Vision Pioneers, a health incubator. And she and then he mentioned that he had a conversation with Elena Pokia, forgive my mangling of surnames, of uh, Data Natives, Data Economy. I said, well, that's really cool. Okay. And Yosha said, well, we'll talk about it with her in a few days. Well, people that know me know that I tend not to wait when there's an urgent issue. So I begged for forgiveness and I just reached out to Elena immediately. Well, Elena, being the proactive person is, she called me immediately. We had a, a conversation and found out that we were in deep alignment. And we said, hey, let's do it. So that happened on Monday. Okay, so it was a Sunday night chat a Monday conversation, and then Tuesday directly into operational planning how we're going to do it. So no money changed hands, no NDAs were signed. All of this was built on trust. So I was able to leverage my network to speak with Elena, and then it's like, hey, who else would be interested? Oh, I know Antonio and Enam would be interested, so I reached out to you, Antonio. And because we have this deep level of trust, understanding, and alignment, you knew what to do, and you started bringing in all the great people from Enom. You brought in Motion Lab immediately, right? No questions asked. Then I called up IZM. I call up my colleague Ulf. There's no questions. There's no, do you need to sign NDA? And so this is the end effect of building a strong network community that you have trust. And then when there's a critical situation like this, I'm just able to contact people and say, hey, I need help. Do you want to join me on this journey? So that's the power of networking and that it, we were able to do this quickly. And we were building a plane as we go. And when you have this trust, you're not watching your back or you know, covering your rear end for fear of mistakes. In, with this circle of trusting people that are empowered, um, that really want to do something, all mistakes are learning opportunities without having to explain. A lot of this negativity that holds people's creativity back from unleashing their greatness is solved by having trust. Now, when you get this trust, that means everyone's respectful. 
uh, addressing each other in kind terms, giving the benefit of the doubt, giving the benefit of good intentions. So we've touched on this briefly before, but let's talk a bit more about building trust. I think that's one of the key things about having a good, strong network that you can then tap into when you want to organize an event or when you want to find the right connections. How do you build that trust, especially with people that might not be in your immediate circle that you might not see very often? Maybe they are in a different country. Maybe you worked with them 10 years ago. How do you maintain the trust? How do you build it first? And then how do you maintain it over time and, and geographies? Genuine connection when you meet someone. That's what it is, opening your heart. Now, you know, excuse me, I'm not 100% with this. I can tell you I screw up on this a lot um, because I tend to be more on the emotional side, which is somehow incongruent. Not somehow, it's a bit incongruent with how Germans think. Oh, the Germans are really kind and they kind of tolerate me. So we're supposed to get a little laugh out of that. It's the strength of the connection. So you'll, I think it's Toni Morrison that said this, uh, someone will always remember how you make them feel. Okay, and I'm not really doing this consciously to like manipulate feelings, but I genuinely want to leave someone a warm feeling when I meet them. That's what someone remembers. So yeah, they, they won't remember your words, they'll remember if they felt empowered, if they felt good about themselves. And that's not being a syncophant or blowing smoke up someone's rear end. It's really heartfelt. And this might not be for everyone. So this is something else I'm gonna share. You know, if you have a startup team, that doesn't mean everyone on your team has to be the empathic person. Pick the person on your team who is the best at that. Don't expect everyone to be like that. In fact, that's unrealistic. Someone like me, I need to have a counter, for example. So I'm very warm, make these connections over time. You do follow-ups and you do genuine follow-ups. So if I'm not randomizing here, that's not a form letter. A one sentence from the heart has more power than a perfectly crafted form letter that it's one page. And I think part of why some of my things stick is because I use voice to text and there's obvious errors, but I'm really trying to stay in touch with a lot of people. So I send messages unintentionally that have errors, but those errors mean it's coming from a human and not a robotic system that's automated for responses. Which actually leads me to my next question. So one of the things I've noticed uh, you do when you network is that not only do you look to make interesting connections for yourself, but you also introduce people to each other. And I think um, the way you do it makes people feel very appreciated. So what I've seen you do, for example, is introduce um, someone to one of your other connections by telling them a bit about this person's work or what they've done before that you think is important or valuable. And of course, that makes people feel good it also makes them remember you and it helps them continue to, to expand their network. So I think that um, is, is a good strategy, even though I don't really want to use the word strategy because I think you do it from a very genuine place of wanting to bring people together. But do you have any other tips and tricks, things that, um, that are quite practical that each of us could do to make networking more enjoyable and also more successful? Look at the person, and I guess it's a strategy. I didn't realize it until actually after I analyzed what I was doing and you know why is it successful, I, you know, which is kind of an affront to me because it's just how I'm wired, right? So it's really through self, a journey of self-reflection that I've learned that there's actually a strategy that I'm uh, invoking here. Don't worry about numbers, worry about genuine. Now, as I'm saying, don't worry about numbers. If you look at my LinkedIn, yeah, I have an insane amount of connections, but believe it or not, I've actually worked to build those. That took me five years of work. So if you get these messages from marketers, hey, add 5,000 connections in a month, that is total bovine feces. You can't do that. What you need to do is incrementally build on those that will help you build your network. So you're saying, you know, like how I introduce people. Well, part of why that works is I, I'm just genuinely in awe of the tech community here. I can't restrain what an honor it is to, you know, I'm an undergrad with a degree in anthropology, okay? And I'm dealing with postdocs that have multiple patents. So have the attitude of a child and the wonder of a child 
That's what I'm doing. That's the energy that's coming out. I am meeting, as far as I am concerned, genuinely the neatest people in the world. And I and that is, and you can even tell that from my voice right now. That's how I feel when I meet someone who's a scientist. I see, as a child, I dreamt about being a scientist, but my life situations put me on a completely different path. Yet that dream is not quenched. It's still, that dream still burns. So. You know, what I'm saying is like more about developing the energy to do it instead of specific techniques, right? If you can only find three or four that you really have this genuinely genuine feeling of love and interest and energy for, that's gonna be more effective in building your network than just trying to tick off names and trying to meet everyone in the room. Also, copy what I do. If you meet someone at an event and you really like them, but it's really not your business, not in your business, one, I'd say keep talking with them anyway. You never know what'll surface. Two, as you meet people in these events, keep your mind open and realize, hey, I should connect these people and go out there and try to connect someone yourself. The point being is to connect and walk away, right? Once you make this connection, leave. And what's that's perceived as, I guess, is like that's giving again, right? As if it's a business or transactional, I'm gonna connect you with someone, then I'm gonna stand there waiting to see how I can get some financial benefit off it. But when you genuinely connect two people and get that conversation going, and this is really necessary with deep tech people because these are very highly focused people that have great social skills, but maybe uncomfortable out of their realm because they're so highly focused. Yes, that's perfect. And definitely good advice for all of us. I have a question regarding sort of this crazy and weird time that we're living in thanks to the coronavirus. We're all kind of distancing ourselves. We're not going to events. Travel's been sort of limited. So a lot of these things that you've been talking about reference to events and introducing that person to this person and so on and so forth. But right now we're not really seeing any of that face-to-face -face connection. I was wondering if you had any insight or advice to sort of keep these true and genuine connections going to maybe even broaden a network in these weird and crazy times. Now is the time to do this. So you know I did those deep tech dinners, right? I've relaunched them. So by the time this podcast is going, that should be quite a big activity. So what I decided is uh, connect, do the same thing I did with the deep tech dinner, but do it online. So I just set up some Google Hangouts and like for the past two days, I've been connecting various people around the world in my network just to have a conversation. Because I know one, everyone's at home. Two, we're all stuck with our family units. I've got a wife and two kids. Let me tell you, this can be stressful. And other parents have been telling me the same. So it's like there's a lot of us professionals that we're still working from home, but we don't have that after work beer or even that, that little conversation walking to the S-Bahn. So what I'm sharing is right now, if you've got three or four people you know and you're not in the same vertical, hell, you're not even in the same business, take the time, make a Google Hangout, get together, have a half hour conversation. And the time is important between 16.30, 4.30 in the afternoon to six. Uh, is proven by neuroscientists that that's a time when humans want to get there and discuss the day, basically, before you go off to family time. So that's what I suggest. The most important thing, act and do something. Get people together. If you don't see the community that you want to join, make your own community. Be your own community. And on this topic, just before we let you go, it's not exactly related to the theme of our episode, but I'm just curious, uh, can you share with us some of your favorite projects that came out of the hackathon, out of Hack Corona? My absolute favorite, favorite that won the Fraunhofer Prize and that Fraunhofer is working with as we speak is a chat bot for do-it-yourself uh, ventilators. Now, why do I love this so much? I've been involved with this uh, DIY medical equipment uh, movement for a while. It really started about three weeks ago. Gui Calvulcante from San Francisco really is the head of this movement that brought together a group of, I think we're 7,000 now hardware and software hackers looking to develop solutions to meet you know supply chain issues during this meaning you know supply chain issues not enough stuff to supply the hospitals because of this 
the, we were now experiencing something you call the tyranny of good intentions, that there's a lot of people with great ideas generating significant amounts of noise. So that means if someone wants to get involved in helping, there's a steep ramp up period. Uh, someone new who's generally wants to learn can ask a lot of randomizing questions. So this, uh, one of the com competitors made a chat bot that ingests in fact, I provided them all the information I had regarding uh, open source ventilator construction. They created a chat bot that parses this information. So if you want to get involved with this movement, you open up a Telegram app and you just start asking questions like, what's the best valve design? You know, where do I go for, you know, what's a good armature for a bag assist device, et cetera. Questions like this. That's why I absolutely loved that project, but it, it, because it empowers what people are doing right now. There was another project to make anonymized tracing. See, for us to beat this problem, we're gonna need to balance our privacy in a different way than they did in China. We have different concepts of privacy. Not one is good, not one is bad. We need to adapt to the European concept of privacy. So one of these companies found, not companies, start, it's not even startup, just groups that came together, the hackathon, developed a way to anonymize an individual yet provide a tracing functionality to identify if someone was within close proximity of another person with coronavirus using uh, RFID uh, functionality on phones and there was an anonymization layer so that you'd never know where that came from but you still could identify if someone was close to another coronavirus, someone infected in order to increase the accuracy of prediction of spread of the disease. I absolutely love those. But what I really love and am heartbroken about is that I couldn't sponsor every single project because every single submission had merit just based not only on the ideas, but on the people. That's right. And going back to what we were discussing earlier, this is an event that was possible because of uh, the ability to bring so many people together so fast. So it's quite impressive. Um, and from what I understand, it's going to continue. Unfortunately, it seems that we will be in this uh, current situation for quite a few months. So it also makes sense that um, events like the hackathon will, will keep going. And who knows, maybe some of our listeners on the podcast will also want to get involved. And if they do, there's a website for Hack Corona. I think it's hackcorona.world where they can go and check it out. We would love it if Startup to Science listeners got involved and you know you have the best contact in the world. That's Enom because Enom's really front and center in this effort. You're not really giving yourself much credit because you're so wonderfully modest, but this effort would not have happened without Enom. That's the power of networking right there and the power of trust. Oh, thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. It was a pleasure to have you on our podcast, and I'm sure we'll talk to you very, very soon. Thank you so much for your time. It was an honor to have this conversation, and I wish you all the best. Thanks for listening to this episode of Startup the Science. I wanted to let you know that Startup the Science is now on Patreon.com. And Tony and I work for the Innovation Network for Advanced Materials, which is Enum Berlin. It's a nonprofit organization, and we do this podcast as a side project alongside our main duties at Enum. We do it because we love doing it, but we also do it because we love supporting scientific startups. We love helping them grow, and we ultimately want to see them succeed. If you'd like to do that with us and could spare the price of a cup of coffee or a really nice cup of coffee, then head over to patreon.com slash startup the science and donate what you can. Again, thanks so much for listening to this episode and we'll see you again next time.